Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us tonight for this presentation on such a significant issue. My name is Wynne Everts, and I'm the Executive Director of the ARC Connecticut. Uh, and it's our pleasure to partner with Oak Hill this evening uh, to talk about this subject. Our presenters this evening will be Brenna Doyle, who is a nonprofit professional and consultant with a focus on the fields of reproductive health, violence prevention, and sexual health education. She currently coordinates Oak Hill's Center for Relationship and Sexuality Education, holding an MA in Gender and Cultural Studies and an MS in Nonprofit Management. Brenna is committed to shifting the culture that makes sexual violence possible helping organizations and individuals better understand how they can be part of this work. Elena Fader is our other presenter, uh, presenter and is an augmentative and alternative communication specialist at the Need Center on, at Oak Hill. With an MA in speech language combined with assistive technology certificate, she is driven by the ways that technology can empower and create opportunities for those with communication differences and physical challenges. Elena has developed NEAT's AAC services to align with this perspective, including coaching and community programs. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn over the floor to Brenna and Elena. And thank you very much, ladies, for being here. Whoops, our presentation is skipping ahead on us. So let me just get it back to where it needs to be. It might be because I have control as well. So I promise not to touch it. It's all you, Brenna, right now. <laughs> Don't peek ahead, everyone. OK. Great, so I'm gonna let Elena tell you all a little bit about how you can access the slides and just a couple notes about some accessibility things we're doing today. Yes, so hi everyone. It's so nice to see so many people joining us this evening. Um, so on the screen here, we have a QR code, which if you've never used that before, um, basically all you need to do is open up your smartphone or a tablet um, and open up the camera, hold it up to your screen, and then that will open up the presentation handout. Um, you can also go to the website, the bit.ly link um, that we have on this slide as well, and that will bring up the handout. So we'll leave this slide up for just a minute or so to give everyone a chance to um, open up the slides. And then if you're having some difficulty with that, we'll make sure that it gets um, emailed out to everybody after the presentation as well. So a few options here. And then while you are doing that, I just do want to touch upon a couple of accessibility things. So you will see captioning at the bottom of the screen today. Um, it is not 100% accurate, but we always feel the need to make sure that our presentations and our services and anything that we do is as accessible as possible. So hopefully the captioning is helpful uh, for some of you out there tonight. And for others of you, it's just kind of a good awareness piece that everything we do um, throughout our day needs to try to be accessible for everyone. Um, so that's the captioning you see at the bottom. And we'll leave it up for maybe another couple of seconds and then we'll keep moving along. Great. Okay, so thanks so much to Wynn for introducing us and going through our bios, really appreciate it. And thank you so much to the Ark of Connecticut for making this possible. We're so appreciative to be here and also to know how many folks are interested in this topic. We were so excited to see the registrations coming in and so glad you all joined us here um, this evening. So we're gonna jump right in and tell you a little bit briefly. I'm just gonna tell you about the center that I work with. Elena will talk about the center she works with and then we'll dive into the content that we're going to cover this evening. So Oak Hill Center for Relationship and Sexuality Education um, was founded in 2001 by Lucille DeGay, who is a licensed clinical social worker working with Oak Hill. And Oak Hill, among other things, has 70 group homes around the state of Connecticut. And Lucille found that in her work with individuals in the group homes, that they were missing some really vital information about their body and about safe sexual expression and healthy relationships. So she founded the center to try to address that gap in information. 
The center has done a lot over the years, and right now we focus mostly on professional development and awareness presentations, like this one this evening. And then we also have learning materials. So we have a full curriculum geared towards secondary students, which is also used in many colleges around the country. And we have a set of seven workbooks for adults. Um, at the end, we'll have some information about those resources and how you can access them. But right now we're super thrilled because our materials are not just in Connecticut, but actually in 42 states around the country and um, in seven countries, including the US right now. So we're so thrilled to have materials that can reach, um, reach a lot of folks in a lot of different areas. Oh, Elena, you're muted. <laughs> ah, all right, here we go. New England Assistive Technology, or NEAT, um, is another one of Oak Hill Centers. Um, and so I work at NEAT as a speech language pathologist and AAC specialist. So I focus on the communication aspect, helping individuals um, of all abilities, all ages who might have difficulty communicating or communicate in a different way, finding technology to help them. But other, other than communication, we also support for a variety of assistive technology needs, uh, learning disabilities, physical differences, um, blind and low vision. Um, so kind of any, any area that we can support, we try to help um, with our evaluations, our consultations and our training services. Um, so if you're interested in more um, information about what we do, um, we've provided our website there. Great. So those of you that registered might have seen this list in the description of the event, but wanted to remind everyone what we plan to cover tonight. We're going to talk about why abuse and assault happen, so what some of the need to know topics are to help build critical judgment about safe, healthy relationships, how to use augmentative and alternative communication or AAC devices to help individuals learn, self-advocate and report, and also what resources are available to help. I also wanna make a note that the topic we're gonna to cover tonight isn't an easy one. It's a, it's a tough topic to talk about it's a tough topic to hear about. And also knowing what we know about sexual violence more broadly, we know that it's unlikely we have folks in this call that haven't been affected in some way, either themselves or people in their lives by this issue. So I just wanna make sure to take a moment and say that this is a tough topic and please take care of yourselves. Um, you all turn your cameras off if you need to, take a walk, you know, mute us you know, take some deep breaths, whatever you need to do, because this can stir some things up for folks. And we want to recognize that the most important thing is you take care of yourself um, throughout this presentation. Okay, so we're going to jump in to talking a little bit about the prevalence of sexual abuse for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In 2018, NPR did a really fantastic deep dive and reporting where they pulled from unpublished Department of Justice numbers and pulled data around um, reported cases of sexual abuse. And in their investigation, they found that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities face a rate of sexual assault that is seven times higher than those without disabilities. And this number we know is a really staggering number. We also know that sexual violence in general is an underreported crime, which means that likely this, um, this rate is probably much higher than seven times. We also know from this report that individuals with IDD are at a heightened risk at all moments of their daily lives, and that they're more likely to be assaulted by someone they know and during daytime hours. And I wanna make sure we note that this number is really tough to hear we don't want it to shut folks down. We want it to be a call to action that this is really gonna require all of us in a community effort to take on this issue and affect change around it. And then also a couple of notes before we start. People with IDD are not inherently vulnerable to abuse. There's nothing about who they are. There's nothing about their disability that means that they um, are inherently vulnerable. We want to always remember that there are unfortunately people who will take advantage of some of the barriers and risks we're going to discuss and use this to hurt other people. The blame for abuse always falls on the abuser and the systems that let abuse happen, never on the survivor. Okay, so next we're going to talk a little bit about, so what are some of these barriers to accessing healthy, safe relationships and what puts someone with IDD at higher risk of abuse? 
So this is a long list, but don't worry, we're gonna dive into some of these more specifically, but this is kind of an overview of some of the barriers we see around this issue. So that first one, a lack of information and education about sexual health, sexual norms and laws, isolation, few reciprocal relationships and limited socialization skills, difficulty recognizing social, nonverbal and body language cues, diminished awareness of boundaries and personal space, both their own and others, limited judgment about personal safety and consequences of sexual behavior, limited insight into own sexual behavior and the effect on others, a compliance eagerness to please and being dependent on others for assistance, and poor assertiveness skills. And again, we're gonna talk about these more in the lens of these, none of these are also things that have to be inherent to someone's disability. There are things that are kind of reinforced by some, some of the structures and systems that we've actually set up to support people. So there's some work that we need to do around kind of the culture that allows some of these things to happen. So this first one, lack of information. There are many school systems throughout the country um, that don't have formal curriculum around sexual health education. And even schools that do have formal education around this, often individuals with disabilities are excluded. There can be a lot of reasons for this. Sometimes it's that individuals with disabilities might have other therapies, might have things that they need to do in a school day. And that sexual health education period is kind of seen as an extra and they might be pulled into other things that need to fit into their schedule. Also, there can be a tendency to think that students with IDD don't need this information. Um, so that might be another reason they may be excluded from learning some of this in the school setting. And that there's limited and often incorrect information about their bodies, including names of body parts or how pregnancy happens. And all of these things basically mean that many individuals with IDD might reach adulthood without really vital information. This little note here is to tell a quick story which was I had a colleague who taught these, um, the sexual health curriculum directly to individuals with IDD. And in that she asked them, does anyone know how pregnancy happens? And a young woman raised her hand and said, yes, you need the egg, you need the sperm and you need the water. And my colleague said, wait, can you tell me a little bit more about the water? What do you mean? And she said, you have to have the egg and you have to have the sperm and then there has to be something in the water. And through prompting, she learned that this young woman was in a group home where multiple staff members happened to be pregnant at the same time. And in discussing this, they said, guess there's something in the water. She internalized that and stored it as a piece of information that taught her what she believed was necessary for pregnancy to happen. So that's a note that people are, as we all are, we're picking up information from all these different areas and if it's not balanced out with correct information about our bodies and about sexual health, it can all get kind of muddled up and lead to some really, diff really important gaps that need to be filled in around this topic. Also, there can be confused expectations about what adult sexual behavior is, but also wanting to be seen as mature and capable. And sometimes trusted adults might not wanna talk about sexuality. There's a lot of reasons for this. Sometimes there can be that focus on the mental age, which as I mentioned, that idea that they don't need this information. Um, I talked with a mom at one point who, while talking about her son, kept saying to me, you have to understand it's like he's seven. It's like he's seven. And I, I completely understood what she was saying. And I did follow up and say, but he's 25. So yes, it's like he's seven, but his body and his urges are that of a 25 year old. So we do need to be giving him information that he can understand about how to keep himself safe and keep others safe as well. There can also be information that makes folks worried. It will make someone curious. We don't tend to see this. What we see is that folks are curious anyway and are gonna try to get the information in some way or another. So we wanna make sure that it's accurate. And as we talked about, there can be a, an assumption, often a misassumption that an individual with IDD is asexual or doesn't have interest in any sort of sexual relationships. And just a general lack of comfort with the topic. It's not an easy topic to talk about. Also, there's not as much opportunity for experiential learning. I would bet if I asked this question and all of, I could see all your hands, 
Um, if I asked you how many of you learned everything you need to know about sex relationships and safety in a classroom, I would bet I wouldn't see many hands. If I did, amazing. I'd love to know what school you went to that taught you everything you could ever need. But most of us pick up some of this information, you know, just in daily life, in interaction with other people. So when we have folks that are much more severely socially isolated, those opportunities for experiential learning can be really limited. And as I said, folks will look for information and often the internet is where children and teens and adults will go for information on sex. And we know that the internet is not always going to give accurate, clear, accessible information that folks need to be safe. Another barrier we see is a culture of compliance. So children and adults with disabilities are denied the right to say no to a variety of everyday choices. There is really a focus on following the rules. There's rewards for that. There's a focus on controlling bad behaviors and this idea that as much as possible, you need to make sure that you're doing what we tell you to do. Um, and again, there's not necessarily bad reasons for that, but when it comes to this issue, it can make it more likely that someone doesn't understand they can say no or doesn't understand, okay, but when am I allowed to push back? When am I allowed to say, no, don't touch me? Um, and making sure that we don't miss something that's being communicated um, during these, what we might label as bad behaviors. And then this eagerness to please, and that many folks might be dependent on others for assistance. So if you're dependent on people for assistance, it's gonna be really important that you please those people, that you make sure that you know, you're following all of the rules that are set for you. And unfortunately, as we talked about earlier, there are people who will take advantage of that culture of compliance in order to hurt someone. And someone might not then know what I just was asked to do wasn't okay. There can also be a lack of understanding about the difference between private and public space. So if someone's dependent on others for assistance, it's difficult for them to understand that concept of privacy. And this little image here, which I'll read to you all, this is from a form asking parents for around information for students that were taking this class. So it says, is the individual considered vulnerable to exploitation or abuse? The mom circled yes. And when asked why, she said, they don't understand the difference between medical treatment and sexual touching. So again, when we think about that information not being clear, you can think about how much that can become dangerous for someone as they're moving through the world. And that there might be multiple caregivers involved. So the person might have to adjust to whoever comes to the door. Think about someone who might be living in in a group home or an assisted living situation. Staffing agencies, just like every other company and organization, people take the day off, people have a sick day, substitutes come in. You might have someone come to your door to say, help you with showering, um, and you've never seen them before. And they say, well, I work with you today, so you gotta let me in, we're gonna do this. That can be really a situation where someone in any other situation would be expected to say, wait, I don't know you, I'm not comfortable with you in my home. But those opportunities to say no aren't as, um, aren't as present often for folks with IDD. Another barrier is difficulty applying the appropriate degrees of trust to relationships. So as you see here, this says family, friends, acquaintance, helper, stranger. These are the terms that we typically use when we're teaching this as some of these categories. What we often find is that because of this social isolation piece, we often talk to them and say like, these people are your friends. Look how many friends you have, which is lovely, but not everybody is your friend. And if you think everyone you meet is a friend, it can make you more vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. Um, so my colleague that taught this class had a moment where it was her first day teaching it. And she said, can you all tell me what a stranger is? And she got answers like someone who smokes, someone who will hurt me, someone in a dark alley. And she said, okay, so who am I? And they said, well, you're our friend. And she explained, I'm not your friend, you just met me, I'm a stranger. So being able to sort through and understand the different degrees of trust and relationships is really crucial information. We have done, I think, almost too good a job teaching the idea of stranger danger. 
Um, and it really does miss the reality of how abuse typically occurs, particularly for this population of individuals. Stranger danger isn't what typically happens when it comes to this type of abuse and assault. So making sure that folks understand not every stranger will hurt you and not everyone in your life won't. And that's tough, but having an understanding of the different types of relationships and trust is a way to at least be able to start to navigate that a little bit more safely. And often because of these blurred lines, there can be poor judgment um, and it can be difficult to navigate relationships safely. So I know those are a lot of barriers, um, but I wanna talk about the fact that we absolutely can shift the culture that allows abuse to be so prevalent. And we're gonna talk also about some of the strategies. Um, Elena is gonna get into some of the specific strategies around communication and this. But I wanted to start off by just saying, one of the kind of everyday things we can do is practice and modeling consent in every interaction. Um, I think back to, so long ago, um, I worked in direct care service. I worked with um, mostly preschoolers with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I worked with a boy who also was in a wheelchair and he tended to slide down in his seat so that he was a little bit wedged between the arm and the seat of the chair. And I would go up to him multiple times a day. I would put my hands under his armpits and I would pull him up in the chair, make sure he was situated. Next time he slid down, I would do it again. And looking back, I, I cringe a little bit because I, I was helping, but I never told him I was gonna touch him. I never gave him a heads up as why I was gonna touch him. I just, I needed him to be sitting up in his chair. I moved his body so that he could be sitting up in his chair. So looking back, I think about what I would do differently. And a big part of that is if that was the case, letting him know, hey, you're sliding down. Are you comfortable like that? Would you like to be sat up a little more? Or if he really does need to sit up, just giving him a heads up like, hey, you slid down in your chair. I'm gonna help you up. I'm gonna put my hands under your armpits and I'm just gonna sit you up in your chair. And giving him a heads up is a way of just modeling that I'm not gonna come into his face and touch his body without at least giving him a heads up about why. Um, so we can create opportunities to safely practice assertiveness skills, um, which goes along with also giving choices. So why I say only real choices there is, um, let's say there's someone who needs some help with bathrooming and they wear a diaper and that diaper needs changing. I wouldn't go up to them and say, do you want me to change your diaper? If I need to change their diaper and they say no, and I say, well, I gotta change your diaper anyway. What I've told them is that their no doesn't matter. Um, so what I wanna try to do maybe instead is say, hey, I need to change your diaper so you can be clean and comfortable. Do you want me to do it now or do you want me to do it in five minutes? And give them the option to still um, assert themselves, have a choice, have that choice respected, and make sure that that's kind of just something that we incorporate into our daily practice whenever we are um, interacting with someone, really interacting with anyone, we wanna do that. And particularly with folks with disabilities because there are a lot of opportunities for us to, um, yeah, just give the opportunity to express their needs and have those needs respected. And then respecting boundaries and speaking up when those boundaries are crossed. I went to a conference and there was a young woman who was a college student who was a peer mentor in a program for individuals who had intellectual and developmental disabilities and were transitioning into college. And she told me this story about one of the boys in her program would come up and hug her all the time. And she wasn't comfortable with that. But she said, I never said anything because I didn't want him to feel bad. I, you know, I didn't want to, I wanted him to feel supported. I wanted him to feel cared for. And we talked about it and I let her know. So that was an opportunity for him to really learn that he had crossed a boundary in a situation where he was still gonna remain safe. But he did something that made you uncomfortable. He didn't respect your body. He didn't ask for consent to touch you. And when we talked before about this idea that experiential learning opportunities are really limited, we wanna take advantage of those teachable moments um, when someone crosses a boundary, they should be told they crossed a boundary um, and not making him feel bad could inadvertently make a situation where in the future he might be unsafe or he might make someone else unsafe. Um, 
So these are some of the ways when we talk about shifting this culture that we think are doable really in any interaction that we have um, and that can really shift things in some positive ways. And then the last thing I wanna mention is some of these need to know topics. So one of our strongest tools to addressing these barriers is information. And we think it's really important that every individual learn about some of these need to know topics. So learning about the real names of body parts. Um, I know that a lot of families might have kind of family names for different parts of the body. They might not always use the kind of official scientific names for body parts. We're not saying that's not okay. We're always suggesting that you always pair it with the real world word. So if you have kind of a, a term you like to use for it and then you always say the real word too. Why we mention this is that it can cause a lot of issues if we don't know the names of our body parts. There was a young woman who um, actually disclosed abuse that was happening to her probably dozens of times it was estimated, but she wasn't using the actual term for her body part. She was using the term coin purse, which is what her family called a part of her body. And she kept saying, someone is touching my coin purse. She said it over and over. She said it to folks. She basically was disclosing and being ignored because people didn't realize what she was saying and she didn't know the real word. So we wanna make sure whenever we're teaching body parts that they know all the words for their body parts so that they can, um, they can ask for help if they need it. Puberty education, consent, respect, privacy, personal space and boundaries. We've talked about some of these. Puberty education is a big one. Um, for anyone in this room that can remember reaching puberty, we all had a variety of like levels of information about that, but it can be really scary if you have no idea what's happening to you. If you don't know what's happening to your body, if you don't know what it means for your future, that's a super scary time. So being able to know um, about puberty and what it means can really be helpful for someone to navigate what is a really stressful time of life. Reading social cues and body language, right touch versus wrong touch. We um, really wanna try to get away from the concept of good versus bad touch um, for a lot of reasons, one of which sometimes touch that is bad might feel good. So it can be a really confusing term to say good or bad. So we try to make sure we stick to right and wrong and what that means. Healthy versus unhealthy relationships. And then when a relationship is abusive, not every relationship that's unhealthy is an abusive relationship, but many of them are. So making sure that we talk through with folks the difference and what are the things that are red flags for making a relationship move into that abusive space. Internet and cell phone safety is a big one. Um, so much of the world is happening online now, even more so during the pandemic. Um, and we also know that folks with disabilities often can access online spaces more easily than in-person spaces. Um, that can be where they can find community. It can be where dating can happen. So making sure that we talk about how these things still apply in online spaces is very important as well. Types and degrees of trust and relationships, we talked about that. Identifying and expressing your feelings is really important. And I know a lot of schools and families do a really good job of this. So the more we can get folks talking about how they feel and what those feelings are, the better. And then making sure folks know about sexual mistakes, harassment, abuse, sex acts that are against the law. Um, partly this is about protecting themselves and also it's about protecting others. Um, prevention education should always be about, should always be given to everyone because we wanna make sure that it's not a lack of information that causes someone to inadvertently hurt someone else or cause harm to someone else. So knowing all of these things is also really crucial. So those are just some of the need to know topics and uh, we'll see we might not get all the way to our resources list, but you all are gonna have the slides. All of this stuff is available in resources that we have. We have seven workbooks for adults that are all free access now. So if you're seeing this list and thinking, well, that's a lot to cover and I am not the expert, we have a list of resources to help you. So don't panic. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Elena now to talk more about some of the specific ways communications can help with this. 
Okay. And so before I get started, I like how Brenna just said about, it's okay if you're not an expert, because I'm going to be honest, I am not an expert in, in this topic. I am a speech language pathologist. I got on board with this project about two years ago. Um, and I feel that there's a need for communication um, in this in this particular topic. So I just want that fact to kind of empower you, no matter who you are, what your role is in the disability community, whether you're a family member, support staff, whoever you are, it's okay if you're not an expert in sexual health and sexual education. This is still a topic that you can address and be a part of, um, just like I am and Brenna are as well. So little caveat. Um, but now let's keep going with some suggestions and strategies to address some of the barriers um, and need to know topics that Brenna presented. So if you think about um, communication, communication happens all day, every day for so many different reasons. But what role does communication play in abuse? So if you take a minute to think about that, um, there are receptive language um, components and expressive language components to that. And what I mean by that is receptive is your understanding of language. So your understanding of communication and the world around you. So if you're not understanding what's happening in a potentially abusive situation, I mean, that's, that's a huge red flag. Also, the other end of it is expressive language. If you have difficulty expressing yourself or you, you communicate in a different way, that can, have a, that can play a role in um, vulnerability and abuse. So take a minute, think about what role communication plays in abuse. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll come up with a lot of different um, roles and reasons. So to th think about receptive language and expressive language, um, I took a look at all of those barriers that Brenna just mentioned. And if you really dive in and look at each one, each one can be linked to a communication aspect, whether it's a receptive language or expressive language. So for example, the first one, lack of information and education about sexual health, sexual norms and laws, or lack of knowledge about your own body. To me, that can be linked to a receptive language def uh, deficit or barrier. So if you have difficulty understanding what vocabulary means or what certain words mean or what somebody is saying to you, that has a direct impact on your ability to understand sexual health, sexual norms and laws in your own body. So we as a community, as, a, um, as an agency and the world around us, we need to think about how can we make this information more accessible and available to individuals who might have receptive language differences. Okay, so I really just went through this whole list. I'm not going to read each one, but what it comes down to is each barrier can be linked to a receptive or expressive language difference. Okay, and we'll, we'll take a closer look at, okay, what does that mean? All right, so continuing here, um, poor assertiveness skills. That is an expressive language um, connection there. You need to have the ability to express yourself um, to be able to assert and advocate for yourself. Um, so again, everything can really be linked to that um, communication aspect. Okay, so, so taking these barriers, taking the connection to communication, I have these three objectives that I'd like to share with you all today. I am tasking you all um, with figuring out ways to help individuals learn, self-advocate, and report. So how can we help individuals learn concepts related to their bodies and healthy relationships? How can we help them self-advocate to promote healthy relationships and then to report incidences of abuse? So, you know, in unfortunate situations where it gets to that point, how can they report the incident and report in a way that will be understood and accepted by others? And a little bit later, I'll, I'll share what I mean by accepted. So the rest of, of the um, session here will be focusing on those three pillars. How do we learn, self-advocate, and report? So to, to tackle that learn aspect, um, again, I've pulled these barriers um, that Brenna mentioned earlier. These are particular barriers that I think are linked to a lack of understanding um, or the need to learn more information, okay? So again, I'm not gonna read all these again, but it's kind of you know making connections here. What's the barrier and what can we do about it? So to help individuals learn about these really critical, important topics, that's where something like CRSC's Positive Choices Curriculum and Workbooks for Adults that Brenda mentioned earlier and that we have um, in the resources at the end of the presentation can really be helpful. So as an adapted curriculum, um, talking about a variety of sexual health topics, that's a good way to start teaching these, these concepts that otherwise are overlooked, okay? 
And now taking it one step further, particularly particularly for individuals who may have these receptive and or expressive language differences, try considering adding symbol supports to main concepts. So symbols are really helpful for understanding new vocabulary, understanding concepts and messages. You know, if you think about, you know, if you're in say a foreign country and you see a sign, you can't read the text, but there's a symbol associated with it. There's a pretty good chance you'll have a better understanding of what that sign or what that situation means because of that symbol. So try thinking about how you can start associating pictures and symbols and other visual supports in, say, the Positive Choices curriculum or some other type of resource that you have available uh, related to sexual health. Um, you can also consider creating new materials, um, especially ones that include those symbols I mentioned to enhance understanding. So yes, it is always helpful to have an existing curriculum, an existing something to go off of. But don't be afraid to create your own, create your own resources, adapt it to, to your individual, to your classroom, to, to the, whatever the situation is, and help to teach these concepts in a very concrete way and embedding those symbols as you see fit um, to help enhance that understanding. Another suggestion for helping individuals learn these really critical need to know topics it to, is to utilize augmentative and alternative communication or AAC. Oops, too far, here we go. And I'll get into um, what AEC looks like and what that means in just a moment here. Um, but I just wanted to share a resource here um, called Boardmaker Online, or actually as of this week on November 17th, they're transitioning to what's called Boardmaker 7. Uh, but this is a software program that you can use. Um, it's a subscription um, that you can pay for, and you can use it to create materials that include symbol supports, as I'm mentioning. So having access to something like this can allow you to adapt materials, like I said, say the uh, positive choices curriculum, adding those symbol supports to enhance understanding or to make your own materials, as I mentioned. So create questionnaires, create um, you know, resources to check for understanding on, on concepts that you've taught. Um, so it's a good resource. Um, I encourage you to check it out. Um, they typically have a free 30-day trial. I do have a little caveat here. I'm not sure with their new program that was released this week what will be happening with that free trial, um, but I really encourage you to, to check it out and see how it might be helpful to teach these really important topics. So this is a screenshot here of an activity that I pulled from Boardmaker Online. Um, they have um, a section for community resources. So anybody who has access to Boardmaker Online can create materials and upload them for anybody else to use. Um, so this one was created by somebody by the name of Timothy Francis, um, who uploaded it to the community um, section of Boardmaker. And you can see here that it's an activity to talk about um, sexually transmitted illnesses um, and, and how they can be transmitted. So it's like a, a sorting chart with a variety of different options like kissing with sores or eating out or sharing needles. So the individual would be um, asked to sort these different topics and decide whether that particular activity could lead to um, sexually transmitted illness or not. So this can be paper-based, it can also be digital, um, but it's just an example of one way to really start teaching these concepts and checking for understanding about these topics. You know, if you had somebody complete this task and the answers were not as you would expect, well, that's a teachable moment. And how can you help to, to change their understanding and help them realize, okay, this activity is, is dangerous and here's why. So again, it's a teaching moment. And you can see how some of these symbol supports can help um, that receptive language challenge. Here is one more example from Boardmaker Online. Um, again, is another activity that somebody by the name of Sam Dew had created and uploaded for, for the community to use. And it is a questionnaire, um, really empowering the individual to have a say in what they want to learn more about. So to, there's a checklist um, with symbols associated with it as well, where the individual could say, yes, I want to learn more, or no, I don't, I don't know what this is. Um, so the examples include finding a partner, internet dating, um, respect, breaking up, personal space. So it's it's just giving that the individual an opportunity to learn more about a topic of interest and an important topic 
or to, to blatantly say, I don't know what this is. And that gives you as the educator or the, the family member, whoever you are, an opportunity to say, okay, great, let's talk about it. Let's learn about it. Um, so that way there's a uh, better understanding of these concepts. Okay, now moving on to AAC. So um, AAC comes in a variety of forms. Um, we consider it a continuum of low or light tech, which is paper-based supports with symbols or just text. Um, and I have a couple of examples here. Um, I know I'm pretty tiny here with the shared screen here, but this is an example of a low tech or light tech board. You can also see an image on the PowerPoint, but it is essentially um, paper-based. You can see the symbols, you can see the text, and it's just laminated. So um, if I was communicating with somebody, I could point to the symbols and it would be up to my communication partner to see where I'm pointing to know that that's my message. So that is one, um, just one example of low tech. It can be a full communication board. It could just be, let's see what else I have here. Um, like a, a smaller, smaller version where it's not a full overwhelming board, um, but paper based um, and still a way to communicate. Uh, moving up a level is something called mid-tech. Typically mid-tech AAC devices are battery operated and you can record your message for voice output. So by pushing a button, for example, this is a Big Mac. I have recorded a message ahead of time. When I push the button, more. it says more. So you can record any message um, onto a device like that. The individual can push the device and then their message is set aloud. So that's just one example of many um, different options of mid-tech. And then last we have high-tech. High tech is typically tablet or computer based, and they often have synthesized speech. So rather than relying on a recording, somebody else recording a message ahead of time, it is more synthesized speech like um, text to speech kind of um, concept. Um, so they come on iPads, um, computers, and essentially you can create spontaneous novel messages. So that's AEC in general. And now let's think about how that applies to this particular topic tonight. Okay, so we're still in that learn category. Remember those three pillars. And in order to help individuals learn these concepts, I'm, I'm imagining AEC has a, has a pretty big role here, right? We talk about these receptive and these expressive communication differences. Now that you know a little bit about AEC, I mean, the, the opportunities are endless when you have an, a way to communicate. So thinking about a robust device, they often include sexuality vocabulary. So a device like the high-tech device or image that I showed you on the last screen, they often include a variety of vocabulary built in by default, but oftentimes they are not available. So whether it's the team or the family, um, with great reason, wanting to hide those or not make them available, we need to make them available. We need to provide direct instruction on what these words mean, how to use them, when to use them, um, and not be so afraid to give access to them. You know, I'm certainly understanding of that fear um, of not wanting to give access, but if we're thinking about safety um, and sexual health and, and having healthy relationships, they need to have the vocabulary to engage in these appropriate and healthy interactions. Um, so just be mindful. If you have an individual who is using a device, try to make these words available, see if they already exist, um, I give an example here that um, an AAC software program called Grid3, one of their super core page sets has um, a My Body grid already in there by default, but actually by default it is hidden. So you have to manually go in there and, and unhide them to make those vocabulary words visible. So I'm just trying to, you know, get your wheels turning to think about, is this vocabulary available? If not, what can I do to make it available? All right, and it really comes down to, um, really just teaching the individuals to distinguish between the right and the wrong time to use the vocabulary, just like you would with any other child or any other adult. There are, are you know, right times to use sexuality vocabulary and there are wrong times to use it. Um, so it's really just another teachable moment. Okay, 
Here on the screen is just another example of an AAC app. Um, it is a high-tech um, device called Grid3 that I just mentioned, but this is actually their vocabulary for life page set. So this is one, um, one visual that shows you um, female health communication in this page set. So it is already there, it is already available, and you can see that there are really critical and important vocabulary words and phrases and messages that somebody might need to use to communicate, whether it be with a doctor, a family member, a friend, um, but it's important to give access to these words. Without access, how could you even begin to, to convey a message related to that topic? Um, so that's just one example. Another example here is from another AAC app um, called Snapcore First. So this is a screenshot of the iPad app. And they, again, have a built-in topic for sexuality. So by selecting this sexuality um, topic, it will bring up a whole slew of words related to this, to this topic of sexuality. So anything can be customized. This is just really a good starting point. And again, like an awareness factor of, okay, it, it's already in there. What can I do to teach these words, to teach them in a meaningful way, and then also expand upon it? Like this is a good platform to, to add more vocabulary and more messages so that somebody can understand that the concepts, again, that receptive piece, but also express to be able to talk about them, ask questions about these topics, and learn more, um, learn more about them. Okay, and then to sum up learning, um, as a speech language pathologist, I'm always speaking about the functions of communication. Why do we communicate throughout our day? You know, we don't just request things here and there. We're advocating for ourselves. We're asking questions. We are protesting. We're arguing. We're describing things. I could go on and on, but related to this, this particular pillar or this subject of learning important concepts, I think it's, it's critical that we explicitly teach the functions of asking questions, answering questions, and engaging in social interactions. So these three functions of communication have a direct link to learning new concepts. If you can't ask a question about something you're unsure of, how are you going to continue that, that growth and that knowledge? Um, so these are just three functions that I think are really critical um, for focusing on to teach these um, need to know topics. Okay, so that was that first pillar of learning. How do we help individuals learn these important topics? Now let's move on to self-advocating. So um, thinking back to the barriers that Brenna presented earlier, I pulled just a few that I think are di directly related to the, the um, issue of self-advocating. So that culture of compliance, eagerness to please, uh, being easily influenced and generally having poor assertive assertiveness skills. We now need to create opportunities to, to knock down these barriers and help individuals learn the reasons, the ways to advocate for themselves. So here are just a few of my ideas on how we can start doing that. And it can really start as simple as direct instruction of specific words, specific vocabulary and concepts. So teaching that word no, what does it mean? How do we use it? When do we use it? That word stop. Well, it can, it can mean like, yeah, we stop at the stop sign. But if I say like stop now, adding that now, that emphasis, that means that that kind of heightens it a little bit. That in itself adds some meaning. Um, so here's just a few words, a few phrases um, that you can see they increase in complexity a little bit so that you can see they're kind of at different levels. But it's really important to start thinking about how do we teach these words so that somebody can advocate for themselves in a particular situation. You know, being able to simply say, I don't like that. If you don't have a way to say that, or you don't know, note that you have even the right to say that, that's a huge problem. Um, so we need to provide direct instruction to explicitly know how and when to use these words. Okay. Oop. And Elena, just quickly, if you are ready at some point, there is a relevant question I can sure. send. Ready? Yeah, go um, for it. So in the chat, we had someone ask, do you have any recommendations for someone that does not have a steady hand to point? That is a great question. And I actually have a slide a little bit later, but I'm happy to address it now. Um, there is something called alternative access methods, which is basically a fancy name for accessing a device in a different way. Um, so whether it be pointing to a low-tech board uh, with a stylus 
or maybe it is accessing a computer with a switch, which is essentially a button that will activate the computer. Or maybe it's something like eye gaze, where you don't use your hands. If you can only control your eyes in a voluntary way, that's okay, because your eyes become the mouse. Your eyes can track things on the screen and then click and make selections just as I would with you know, a traditional computer mouse. Um, so I would suggest that if you do have an individual who can't interact with an AAC device in a traditional way, investigate what's called alternative access methods. And I'd be happy to have a, a separate conversation and, um, to explore that more. Okay, so I hope that, uh, that answers the question, um, but feel free to, to add more in the chat if you want me to expand. Okay. All right, so continuing on with um, how AAC can help with self-advocating. Um, I encourage you to incorporate symbol supports into routines for activities of daily living, and that can really support that receptive language barrier. So for example, um, you know, Brenna mentioned earlier um, showering or toileting routines. You know, if an individual has very concrete, like a visual schedule with symbols to say, this is what happens in my toileting routine. If something atypical happens in that toileting routine, that could potentially be like a red flag to say, this isn't normal, something doesn't feel right, and, and I need to, to self-advocate. I need to tell somebody that this, this toileting today was very different. Okay, so by adding symbols and, and helping um, make that routine very concrete, that can help somebody um, have an opportunity to be able to advocate for themselves. Again, just having access to, you know, simple low-tech boards or um, low-tech advocacy boards to support that expressive language. And I'll show you another example in a second. Just having access, that in itself allows somebody to self-advocate. If, if you have no way to say no or to say stop now, well, then uh, that's a very unfortunate situation. So if you have access to a low-tech board, you now have an opportunity to do that. And then I also suggest... Um, so more in like classroom-based settings, there's something called core word of the week, where you can teach specific vocabulary words in a very systematic way. Um, so I, I think this approach can apply here as well. If you're trying to teach that, that message of, I don't like that, there's examples, um, resources online, and I've provided it here to help you, give you ideas and strategies like lesson plan type um, concepts for how to teach these words. And here is just an example of a low tech board, like I mentioned, just by having access to something like this and being explicitly taught how to use it. Now an individual can maybe point to a word and say stop, right? You can see that red stop sign, that symbol. I now know that I can say stop if something in my toileting routine doesn't seem right or doesn't feel right. Um, you know, words like um, no or um, help, you help, I need help, something didn't feel right. Um, I need help with something. So you can see how just a simple board like this can open up a lot of opportunities for advocating. All right, and then linking it back to communicative functions, why do we communicate throughout the day? Explicitly teaching the, the skill of protesting or arguing being able to say no, linking back to that culture of compliance. It's not okay to always just say yes and, and do whatever you're told. Um, you need to have opportunities to go against that and say when something isn't right. Um, so I think really um, finding opportunities to teach protesting and arguing can be really helpful for advocating. And then also just you know expressing emotions. If, if somebody has never been taught how to say how they feel or they've never been given a mode of communication to express I feel upset or I feel sick or I don't feel right. I mean that, and again, um, that's huge. So we need to give opportunities to express that to then advocate for when something doesn't feel right. Okay, now moving to the last pillar here, reporting. So, so we suggest having a crisis plan. So whether it's for, you know, unrelated to sexual health, just an emergency plan um, for an individual with IDD, particularly when they have communication differences, having a plan in place, if something were to go wrong, um, just has, has an opportunity for reporting right there, right? If you have a plan and then that, that incident happens, there's, there's kind of like a consequence. You know what's going to happen next, that predictability. Um, also having a concrete plan reduces the likelihood that a predator will abuse the individual. You know, we, we oftentimes, you know, the statistics show that a predator 
is sadly somebody that the individual knows. So if the individual knows this predator, the predator knows that there's a crisis plan in place if an incident occurs, that predator will probably be much less likely to abuse that individual because they know that they would get caught, right? So that's kind of like a, a simple way to just avoid the situation altogether. Have a plan of what that individual might do in, in a situation like this. And I'll give you some suggestions um, shortly. So in terms of incorporating AAC, it's really similar to the, the learning and the self-advocating steps, having access to a light tech board um, with messages or vocabulary that the individual can use to report that something has happened. Um, just making the vocabulary available um, and teaching how and when to use those messages can make all the difference for being able to report in a, in a critical situation. So incorporating AAC into that crisis plan can be helpful. And I do have to say, even if um, the particular individual maybe is verbal, they do communicate fairly well. In a heightened situation like this, you know, anybody would have a difficult time communicating. So it's also okay to have kind of a backup system, an AAC system for situations like this, but also being mindful that you can't just throw the board in front of the individual in the, situ in the, in the moment and, and assume they'll know what to do with it. So that's where that pre-planning and that direct teaching ahead of time can really be very helpful. This is another low-tech board um, that I created using BoardMaker Online, uh, but kind of modified that SnapCore first um, software that I did mention earlier. Um, and so I created this um, for the American Academy of Pediatrics conference a couple of years ago, just to show pediatricians and doctors um, the importance of AEC, but then also, you know, what can they be doing in their conversations with patients to detect abuse and do something about it. So simply by including that word abuse in this board, that gives an individual an opportunity to point to it or to, to gesture to it and indicate in a, um, whether it be in a doctor's appointment or in another situation, just to, to say abuse. I mean, if somebody pointed to that symbol to me, I mean, obviously huge red flag, that would indicate something is wrong and we need to investigate this further. So simply giving access to that word teaching it ahead of time, you know, what does that word abuse even mean? Um, that can be an avenue for somebody to report when, an, when it, uh, a situation has happened. And now this is the backside of that same um, core board that I created, um, where it's, you know, including body parts, yes, no questions, being able to differentiate, is it something on the left side of my body, the right side of my body? So I just really wanted to give you um, an example of how visuals can really be helpful, right? I might not be able to, you know, say in a long complex sentence that something has happened to me and it, you know, and where it, where it hurts. But by having symbols and um, another representation system to, to share that information, I now have a way to report. I do want to point out though, again, I made this a couple of years ago. I said already, I'm not an expert in this, but I am learning and I'm, I'm expanding um, you know, the knowledge base around this topic. So now looking at this, I, I know that there's things that need to be modified. So looking at this, what content should be changed? Well, the first thing is this image, right? If we are giving individuals an opportunity and a way to report that something has happened to their body, we can't cover those body parts. I know it might feel strange. It might seem like, oh no, we can't do that. But by having an actual picture of various body parts, somebody can now point to it and indicate that something has happened to them um, so that we can do something about it and investigate. Um, so I would, I'm planning to change that picture, but I like to, to show this um, original version for, um, to make a point there. And then also here, the rating scale. So my, my thought behind this was, you know, can somebody tell you if something hurts really bad or if it's okay or if it's absolutely terrible? But thinking back to what Brenna had said earlier, we need to be mindful of what vocabulary we are using and how we're presenting it. As she said, something might be bad, but it might feel good, right? So that's confusing. So again, just being very mindful of what words you're using um, and how you're teaching them. All right, so continuing on the crisis plan, um, this is a snapshot from the SnapCore First AAC software again, and they have an emergency topic already built in there. So by default, you open the app, you go into their topics, and you see all kinds of messages related to an emergency. So the, the um, red highlighting there is showing 
um, various messages that can be explicitly taught to somebody to use in the in the event of a crisis. So there's things like, um, actually, I can't even read them now. I feel violated, right? Maybe violated is a, a new term. How do we teach what that word means? Or maybe you customize it to, to customize it to say a different word than violated. But regardless, it's there. You're explicitly teaching it ahead of time. So in the event of a crisis, an individual will learn and know to go into this topic, to go into this emergency section and press one of these buttons to report that something has happened to them, right? And again, we need to teach the meanings. We can't just assume that somebody will know how and when to use these messages. All right, and here's just quickly the slide um, back to the alternative access that I mentioned. So I'm really glad that question came up because it's so important that we think about um, so individuals with IDD might also have communication challenges. They might also have physical differences. So we still need to be giving all of these opportunities for learning and self-advocating and reporting, even if they cannot communicate in a traditional way, and even if they cannot interact with a communication device in a traditional manner as well. Um, so here's just a few images of um, this man in the middle is using a head switch. So he's able to move his head uh, voluntarily. As he pushes that button, it will then activate a message on the computer. Um, you can see in the uh, right-hand corner, there's an adapted stylus for somebody who uh, needs to grip it in a particular way. And you can also see images of the eye gaze um, tracker that I mentioned, as well as a key guard that can overlay on top of an iPad or a tablet um, to help somebody access buttons a little bit easier. Um, and then there's also head tracking. So there's a variety of ways. And I just encourage you to explore, reach out to us at NEAT if you're not even sure where to start, um, because more often than not, there, there is a way. It's just a matter of getting creative and figuring it out. Okay, and then again, linking back to those communicative functions, why do we communicate? It's so incredibly important to help these individuals learn the skills for retelling narratives, retelling something that happened, including sequencing information. So if you think about, you know, you recounting your day or recounting that something, something that has happened, that's a skill to be able to think back, retell what happened in the correct order, tell who was there, what happened, what they looked like, that's a skill. So we need to be teaching that in general, but then in, in, um, in direct connection with this topic. If, you know, God forbid an incident happens, if you have no way to say what happened, where you were, in what order things happened, then you're kind of at a loss. So we need to teach that skill in a very concrete way. And then again, expressing emotions, that, that's a huge thing for reporting. If you don't have a way to say you're upset, um, then that can um, impact your ability to report. Whereas if you clearly have a way to, to say that something has happened, that in itself can report um, an incident. To say that you're upset, that's reporting, okay? All right, so, so those, those communicative functions of expressing emotions and retelling information, retelling narratives is so important for many ways, but particular be, particularly because of the forensic interview process. So when um, a sexual assault um, case occurs, forensic interviewers are called in to investigate, ask questions, not in the leading way, there's a very systematic way of doing it, but to really um, try to figure out what happened um, and to identify um, a perpetrator. Um, so so in, our, in, in this project, we've discovered that forensic interviewers are often unable to conduct interviews with individuals with IDD due to their communication differences and challenges. So, you know, if, if an incident has occurred, forensic interviewers are called in, but the individual has no way to report what has happened, or maybe they try to report it, but again, they don't have those, those retail skills, those um, narrative skills, then it just gets very convoluted. And sadly, more often than not, the, the cases are often dismissed, right? The forensic interviewers are doing everything they can the individuals are doing everything they can to, to convey what happened, but there's just so much disconnect. Um, so we need to do something about it. So to do something about it, um, NEAT and CRSE, we are working to connect with these forensic interviewers, hearing more about the, the interview process, what happens, and then in turn sharing insight, um, suggestions, and tools to help 
break down those communication barriers. That way the interviewer can have a better understanding of what happened and the client is, has more opportunities to report and convey what has happened. Um, we also are trying our best to spread awareness that when, when used appropriately, messages that are conveyed using AAC are in fact the individual's messages. I think sometimes, you know, it might seem strange that somebody's using a different type of way to communicate and how do you know that it's really that individual? And some of that confusion can be linked to kind of a, an old school train of thought of facilitated communication um, where, you know, that's a whole nother topic, but it's basically where an individual um, with a communication difference is maybe typing on a keyboard or handwriting and there's another um, another adult, somebody supporting them in that handwriting or in that typing process. So it, in, in cases like that, it's hard to know, well, was it the individual? Was it the person supporting? How do you know whose message that is? But that is completely different than the AEC I am talking about. The AEC I am talking about is the individual, is the individual trying to convey a message um, and oftentimes trying to report something that has happened to them. So if you hear somebody trying to report, believe them, know that that message is, is, um, should be heard and that you need to do something about it. All right, so those were just some suggestions. Again, things that I have on my mind that I'm hoping to have conversations about. I think that this could be the start of um, hopefully some change, but we have a long way to go. So we are always open to ideas and suggestions and things that you have as well um, so that we can start changing that statistic um, that Brenna mentioned earlier. And to read this out for anyone that's joined us on the phone, this slide says the ultimate goal is to increase critical judgment about safe, healthy relationships. And this quote here, one of the best ways to stop sexual assault is to give people with intellectual disabilities the ability to identify abuse and know how to develop the healthy relationships that they want. So our hope is that this has helped you all learn a little bit more about some of the skills and techniques. Um, and Elena and I are happy to take questions um, that you might have. You can type them into the chat there. Um, and we still, we did pretty well on time. We still got a little time for questions, which is great. So. We'll do our best to answer any that you have. Okay, so we have a question. Is there a program curriculum to address boundaries and health that you would recommend for middle school students? That's a great question. Um, so our curriculum is mostly used in high schools, but I will say I think a lot of the material can be adapted for middle school students especially because we try to make it as accessible as possible for all learning levels. Um, a lot of it will depend on your school district, um, what restrictions there are and what you can teach. So I don't have a specific middle school exact curriculum, but I will say our positive choices curriculum has many, many topics. I mean, the first chapter doesn't, you know, the, if you taught the entire first chapter, it's things like boundaries. It's consent, but not about sexual behavior. It's consent, like what does consent mean? What does it mean to say, you know, this is my body, this is my personal space. There's a lot of topics that can definitely be taught to um, younger learners um, and can be adapted as well in that case. Other folks might have other ideas for that, um, but that would be one of my suggestions is using some of what's in our, our current curriculum for that. Um, oh, great question. So what is an example of sexual mistakes? Yes, um, so that's a term that we started using because there are certain things that aren't, they aren't necessarily like someone wasn't trying to cause harm, but they made a mistake that caused that harm. So it's kind of a phrase that we use to capture some of those things where it's a lack of knowledge, it's a lack of understanding what happened, not a malicious intent or not trying to hurt someone. Uh, so a sexual mistake might be, um, you know, it might be you see a picture online um, of a naked body and you send it to someone else. Now I will say that can be against the law, but sometimes it can be a mistake. Sometimes it can be you didn't mean to send it or you didn't understand that you weren't allowed to send it. So it doesn't mean that sexual mistakes are not ever against the law. And it doesn't mean that if you make a sexual mistake that's against the law, you won't face consequences. But we try to talk about it as things that are, that are on the side of, I need more information, I made a mistake, 
I want to make sure I don't make the same mistake again. Those types of things when we talk about that. Um, yeah. Okay. So instructional videos. Um, great question. It is something that I've been thinking about because I think we need to make some. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head that currently exist. Elena, you may. Um, but it's, we know that there are learners who, you know, every learner really benefits from like a multimodal approach. So learn some learning through something that's written, learning through visual cues, learning through a video. So it is um, something I'd love to start making is some instructional videos. We always encourage folks in the teacher manual for our curriculum and we're working on a companion guide to the workbooks. We do talk about considering making some of those um, or just making recordings of yourself reading parts of the workbook. Because again, you might have an auditory learner that really is taking it in better when they can hear it. Um, and certainly we don't always have the opportunity to be in a classroom these days. Um, and I will also say that I'm gonna take that question with me and see if I can find any for you. And if I find some good ones, I will send them along for sure. Okay, now it looks like we have a question about using AEC and symbolized communication for older adults who may have no experience in the past. That is a great question. Um, at NEAT, we always say you're never too anything to use AEC. So you're never too young, too old. Um, it just might be in how you introduce it. Um, so I really would suggest starting with like a low-tech board. Um, Project Core is a great website um, as like a starting point with those core vocabulary words like stop and no. Um, so that can be a starting point, but just know that it's kind of like you just introduce it very slowly, explicitly, um, and there's no reason not to. Okay, so um, whether it's low-tech or you start um, exploring high-tech AEC apps, I would say you just do it in a very slow, systematic way, okay? But um, I would absolutely encourage still doing it, even if there's no prior experience, okay? Hope that answered the question. These are all great questions. I also love questions where the answer is, I don't know of it yet, because then it just puts the idea in my head that we should probably make it, so. Exactly, yeah. I agree. I love, so I love things. We're always looking for more to do. So yes. <laughs> All right. So we're happy to answer more questions. We're also, as I said before, we, we want to hear from you. Do you have other ideas, other experiences that you've had that you think others um, can benefit from hearing? Um, now is a good opportunity to share that. And also as those start coming in, and we'll keep an eye on the chat, also wanted to show you what else is here, which is our contact information. So myself, also our websites for um, CRSE, and for the NEAT Center. These are great spots to start. Um, we are always happy. I know sometimes I'll go to a presentation and then sit, think of my six questions the next day. So reach out to us. Um, we're not gonna disappear after this as well. And then we also will have these slides will be sent out and there's a list of resources um, that we think are helpful for folks for additional learning. The top one there is a resources page on the CRSE website and that has Oh my gosh, so many resources. They match to different workbooks, um, but they also are just really good um, opportunities to learn some more. And then this, as I said, is our seven workbooks for adults, um, which we are so thrilled. I, I just can't stop being happy about it, that they're all available to download for free from our website. We wanted there to be no barriers to people accessing these. Um, and as you see, we have a health series and a relationship series. Um, and those are the titles. You can get a little bit of an idea of what they cover. I'll also say we mentioned online safety. Um, in our workbook, um, I think it's both in 10 tips and in attractions and safe dating. There are sections that we've added in about some online safety topics about, you know, um, sex acts that are against the law online. So there's a lot of good content in there because I know that comes up a lot for folks of I want to know more about how to keep folks safe online. So we have some good content in there as well. Great. So we'll, we'll definitely hang out for a few minutes. We've got a little time. So I know folks might be typing. And also just thank you all for joining us. Um, it makes me so happy when people care about this topic and are willing to give up some of their evening to learn about it is amazing.
Okay, I actually have a question. Sorry, oh, it's super dark. I was taking notes. Um, I'm Christy. <laughs> I'm from uh, Oak Hill as well. Um, for you, love you guys. I, I was wondering if we could invent something or if something's already invented. Um, I was wondering if for the communication boards that are electronic, if there was a button that somebody could press, I don't know, a couple times, say it was help and then it would start recording. So maybe that would deter somebody from who was about to act to stop because it's recording <laughs> you in the act. Is that available? That is a brilliant idea, Christy. To my knowledge, it is, I don't know if that exists. Um, I think that would make a huge impact um, to be able to have that voice output, but then to record an incident. So you and your brilliant ideas all the time. Um, I think we should talk more about that. Um, unless somebody else on the line know, does know of something like that that exists, um, I think I think that could be huge. Yeah, and I think our you know our assistive technology center. I firmly believe our wizards. Um, they come up with just the most amazing um, ideas for things. So if it doesn't exist yet, I bet we can come up with a way. I love that idea, and I think that's also something that could probably there could be other uses for that kind of quick access. Um, I'm thinking, you know ways to ways to contact someone wait you know i think there's a lot of great ways but i love the idea of recording and we didn't have time to get into it tonight although elena did touch on it but there often are a lot of issues around um the court system being able to move forward with cases like this and sometimes if if there were the ability to have that kind of evidence that could be really um, game changing in a lot of these cases yeah and I, another thing, another thought that just came to my mind when you said that, Christy, is um, I'm on another, like a, a board where we're trying to figure out how in the state can we change things? How do we change how um, people can report incidences? So um, there's talk of like developing an app where somebody could report um, an incident more easily, more accessibly. Um, so there could be a, a way to maybe it's on the phone that it happens or something like that. Um, so my wheels are turning now. Thank you for that. And I see a question, do you incorporate pop culture, images, TV shows, movies, et cetera? Um, I think you're probably asking about kind of in instruction of um, these materials. So we always encourage folks to use what's relevant to students, um, to any learner. So our curriculum um, does leave a lot of wiggle room for individual instruction to figure out what works best for your individual students to try to adapt it to work for them. So I definitely recommend using what's relevant to the learner to help concretize and make more um, kind of help it sink in the information because a lot of times, yeah, you'll have someone who there might have reference points with a particular pop culture um, situation. There might be social media is huge, especially when we talk about online safety using examples from social media can be really helpful um, to learn some of these topics. I don't think there's any shortage of situations you could use as teachable moments when it comes to, hey, this was a situation where someone did not ask for consent, or this is a situation where someone crossed a boundary. Definitely recommend use what's relevant to the learner um, as much as you can to make it as fresh as possible. A quick question. Um, I'm wondering about uh, being a bystander and if there are, um, if there's resources that are available to people and how they might insert themselves into an uncomfortable situation. So say that they're, you know, with um, a family or they're, they're, they're in company of in, an individual with a disability and someone is acting inappropriately to them where you're uncomfortable, you know that that's not right, but it seems as though there, this is probably, this just goes on in that in their life. Um, so are there resources that people can access that would give them some tools to address or you know, stand up and say something um, in that kind of situation? Um, it's a great question. I think it's a it's a complicated one, mostly because some of it will depend on what is the person's role in their life. Um, when it comes to um, mandatory reporting applies in this situation for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So if there's a situation where someone is a mandatory reporter um, and they see something that 
gives them pause like that, that their responsibility is to, to report that. Um, and I will give my kind of reminder I always give with mandatory reporting that a mandatory reporter's role isn't to investigate, it's to report. So you probably won't have all the information, but if you're seeing something that's making you think there's something wrong here. Um, so that's one piece of it for mandatory reporting. Um, if there's, and it kind of depends on the, what the situation is when you're not a mandatory reporter. If it's a, if it's a situation that's clear abuse, if it's a situation where someone is in immediate danger, still reporting, still making sure that there's some immediate help there um, is always gonna be my recommendation. If it's a little more like, this is a situation where someone's learning something that's not great. You know, They might be learning from modeling with a family member that it's okay to cross boundaries or that people can touch them without their consent. Those types of things can get a little more complicated because when we're working with families, um, you know, families have their own way of doing things. There might be situations where, um, you know, a family is not super receptive to this type of education. So there, I think recommending to folks that they maybe have a set of these workbooks that they can, you know, at a time when they feel comfortable say like, hey, this is a resource I found really helpful. We've been sharing it with all our families might not be true, but it might be a way to kind of start to get the information to folks. Um, and modeling is huge. So even if there's a situation where someone might not feel comfortable speaking up in that situation, um, or might feel like they're crossing a, a family boundary that the family isn't open to, if they have interactions with this, um, with this teen or adult or child, they can be that other voice, that model of, um, of appropriate behavior or that model of here's how I can make sure I always am showing them, here's what consent is like. Um, because a lot of it might be where are they getting their messages and can we be another voice? Um, so that's a, I hope that helps to answer. It's definitely, de a lot of it will depend on the situation, but um, I, think, I think those are some of my suggestions. Elena, do you have anything to add there? I don't actually. I think that that kind of sums it up because yes, you know, it can be very uncomfortable. Um, we see things all the time um, that might not be what we might do in our own families. So I think it's taking a step back thinking, you know, how should it be approached? How extreme is the situation? How dire of the need is to report it right now as opposed to just like an educational approach? Um, but yeah, I think you addressed that very well. And I'll also add, um, this is a great time to kind of reinforce what Elena said about having a, an emergency plan. Anyone can set up an emergency plan and it can be about anything. So maybe it's, if you know you're gonna be working with folks with IDD or you know you have a situation where you've seen some things coming up that make you feel a little bit, something's not quite right here, that could be a great time to either come together as a team or find someone to brainstorm with and come up with like, if I see this again, what do I do so that I don't kind of freeze in that moment? Um, some of us are going to have situations where we, we wish we had done something differently in that moment. And that's, that's okay. We're human. We're going to make mistakes, but that's a learning opportunity for us too, to then take a step back and say like, okay, I need to make sure that in the future, um, I have a plan in place, um, because plans can be really helpful with that freeze moment for a bystander so that you've kind of practiced it in your head and you have a little bit of a sense of what you might do in a variety of situations. These have all been such great questions. And thank you for asking questions. <laughs> it can be hard as a presenter when everybody doesn't, so we really appreciate it. And I know a lot of them are hard questions too. Again, this, you know, it's a difficult topic, so we appreciate you jumping in and um, saying which, what's on your mind. Oh, I'm gonna say thank you very much to Brenda and Elena for really doing an unbelievable job with the difficult topic and bringing us a tool set to use and resources to go to uh, to help 
people navigate this really complex issue. And uh, well done, really well done. Thank you very, very much uh, for, for this. Um, we will be sending these presentations to the people that uh, came this evening. And we really appreciate, um, we really appreciate the, the breadth uh, that you dealt with this topic. It's really, really good, the, the tools and everything. Very thought provoking. And thank, thank you, you and thank you for oh, <laughs> thank you for partnering with us. Um, you know, again, this was yeah. a partnership between the Arc of Connecticut and, and Oak Hill, and I think it's it's important that agencies are connecting about this so that we can continue to spread awareness. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your night and happy holidays, whatever those look like for us this year. Right. Yeah. Thank you, thank everyone. You. And the same to you. And thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening.